So there were four microphones in the history of music production that were so influential, so powerful, that they fundamentally changed the trajectory of music history. All of them were made by the same company and all of them were the next generation of the one prior to it. Let's call these like the grand elders, I guess, for, for fun. This, the Neumann U87, is the final form. Understanding the history of this microphone is like understanding the history of recorded music. Period. Let's find out why. So we're at my friend Jake's studio, Paper Moon Studios, and this is an insane space. I have never seen a home studio as beautifully made, beautifully organized, and as cozy as this. The living room is a live room and we're in the control room. It's insane to me that we're at a home studio that even has this level of power to it. If you need any production work, you're in the Brooklyn area, go ahead and visit the website down below. And just thank you to Jake for letting me even do this. <laughs> Okay, so going into this history of music technology, it's fundamental to understand that the history of recorded music follows a progression from dark to bright. Sometimes this was just due to the technical limitations of whatever era we're talking about, and sometimes it was a very conscious effort to reinterpret production norms. And you'll really start to see this take effect around the 1960s. But anyways, I am totally getting ahead of myself. Remember how I said there are four microphones, the audio grand elders that had all the influence? Well, times before that first elder were dark, literally dark. Early recording apparatuses could really only only record from 200 hertz to 1500 hertz, which sounded a bit like this. And these machines were a wild way to record music. Gramophones or phonographs were another one. They were these huge giant conical horns and they used the disruption in airways caused by all the sound to physically vibrate a stylus. And this would then cut into melted wax, therefore pretty much directly cutting the audio during the live performance. Real musicians record on wax, bro. It's the most honest tone. <laughs> Hello, fancy seeing you here. You're probably wondering why I'm laying down on this sit-stand desk. Well, that's because this one can hold up to 440 pounds, which is the same amount as a black bear or a gorilla or a dolphin, which is not as impressive as the other two, but it is true. In all seriousness, FlexiSpot sent over this sit-stand desk for our living room studio, and it is genuinely awesome. I can change the height of the studio monitors, which I know seems ridiculous, and that's not really the intended purpose of this desk, but it is helpful for mixing. I want to do a test here. I have water, and I'm going to lower the desk, and I want to see how stable the water is. So watch the water line. That's pretty good. The height that you can get to on this thing is absolutely ridiculous. I'm almost touching the ceiling right now, and now this thing is basically the same height as a coffee table. Don't talk about my cable management. I don't want to hear anything about my cable management. We're working on it. Now they have an anniversary sale running up until August 31st. You can get up to 50% off on a lot of these desks, plus an additional 10% off with my code AudioHaze. Not to mention that when you buy one of the E7 series desks, you get another 50% off their ergonomic office chair. Thanks to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video and let's get back to it. You needed a lot of power in the vocal to move that stylus and even show up in the recording. So singers used to step in front of the band and yell into that horn, basically obstructing the 10-piece band behind them and then quickly move out of the way whenever their vocal was done. And because those gramophones only recorded about one-eighth of the full range of human hearing, the vocals featured on these tracks were vocals that suited that range of hearing, and genres as well. So as a result, male tenors that specifically belted their vocals, or like opera singers that were classically trained to amplify volume, that's the kind of music that ended up being popular. Even right up to the late 1920s, most of the microphones that were available for use could only record up to 3 kilohertz. So for reference, here's what that sounds like. And then the almighty first Grand Elder showed up on the scene. This is such a weird metaphor, but we're going with it. The Neumann CMV3, or the Neumann Bottle. This is the first mass market condenser microphone, and it changed 
everything. The CMV3 represented a major bump in brightness and audio fidelity. It could go all the way up to 15 kilohertz. Not only that, but it killed a lot of the background buzz that other microphones had. It had less signal to noise ratio, and it came with interchangeable heads, so you could change the direction that the microphone recorded audio. And with these improvements in audio quality, we saw the rise of broadcast radio. And that is where the Neumann bottle really started to see widespread adoption. But does anybody maybe notice a problem here? <laughs> German company Broadcast Radio rose to prominence in the 1930s. Hmm. The CMV3, the Neumann bottle, was widely used by the Nazis, which really sucks. But anyways, let's move on. So take a listen to this recording. This was recorded in the 1920s. Something to little lovebirds. We're not above birds. Let's misbehave. Now take a listen to this one by Bing Crosby. Leaving me with a memory. The microphone had done something pretty incredible by this point in history. The vocal had become king. The voice didn't have to be like classically trained or be loud belts. Improvements to microphone technology and also just improvements to recording technology in general had allowed other vocal styles to essentially rise to prominence. And you saw this make waves immediately. Bing Crosby was the face of something called the crooner movement, which was like the 1940s version of like Harry Styles. So what exactly was this crooner music? It was comprised of primarily male singers singing in a head voice dominant mix, a very soft vocal tone, very soothing, almost lullaby-like. Oh, but that was long ago, and now my consolation is in the stardust of a song. And it's one of the first pop music genres to prioritize vocals over everything else. And women loved it. They loved Bing Crosby and crooner music so much that an industry started to develop. Music for profit, music as a commodity, the modern music business was starting to form. Many artists started to follow in Bing Crosby's steps, notably Frank Sinatra. We started to see countercultural movements with rock and roll like Chuck Berry, Louis Jordan, Elvis Presley, Little Richard. Vocal dominant music was popping up everywhere. It was getting louder, more complex, and more dynamic. And at the time, the market was flooded with RCA ribbon microphones. These are very dark vintage microphones. The Neumann bottle would only top out at around 15 kilohertz, and these ribbons were naturally very dark. So a need was growing for a microphone that could prioritize vocals more than all the others are. And so Neumann introduced our second grand elder. In 1949, they invented the Neumann U47. So the U47 had two characteristic changes to its tuning that prioritized the vocal. But in order to really fully understand these changes, we need to understand something called a frequency response chart. This is the frequency response chart for the the ribbon microphone, an RCA44, one of the most popular microphones at the time. Now, as we both know from earlier in the video, humans hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The taller the spike is on this line chart, the louder the microphone is in that specific frequency range. So with that in mind, looking at the RCA44, as we get up to 20 kilohertz, we start to notice a decline in volume. The really high, bright stuff, like the cymbals, and notably a lot of the detail of a vocal, that wasn't being prioritized in these microphones. But with that in mind, look at the tuning of the Neumann U47. Where all the vocal detail was lost in these ribbon microphones, this microphone boosted and prioritized. This allowed the vocal to finally sit atop all of these mixes in a much brighter, more prominent way. And the result was nothing short of explosive. All the vocals on the Beatles' Abbey Road were recorded either with a U47 or a related microphone called a U48. Frank Sinatra adopted the U47 and called it his instrument. Bob Dylan recorded on the U47. Honestly, just name any early 60s and late 50s pop genre, it probably used the U47. Telefunken started 
to ship U47s under their brand name. So yes, a Telefunken U47 is the same thing as a Neumann U47. And with the rise of this Neumann, you started to also see a rise in the modern microphone technique. It was really Frank that pioneered this, which essentially amounted to using the microphone as a way to control vocal dynamics. Getting closer to the microphone to essentially exaggerate the bassiness of your voice, make a more intimate sound, moving away from the microphone during a belt in order to match the volume of that really close intimate tone. The U47 was just revolutionizing everything. And then an ironic problem started to occur. The year is 1960. Rock and roll, rhythm and blues, and country music, they're all having their first sort of explosive rise in popularity. And vocals were getting so loud that it was distorting the U-47. It just wasn't breaking, but the U-47 wasn't sounding like it was supposed to. All this increase in aggression in vocals basically meant that these microphones couldn't keep up with the power in these new sort of genres. And the microphone would start to distort. This is ironic, considering this age of production is is such a desired sound for that exact reason. People love tube distortion, it's why tube microphones are so expensive these days, because of the analog imperfections in the equipment. But back then, most producers did not want this sound. So in 1960, Neumann set out to basically resolve this issue by creating the U67. So without that heft in the mid-range, and just with that bright presence boost, it wasn't hitting those preamps as hard and not distorting as much. This is the sound of rock and roll. Hey Jude, Sympathy for the Devil, Voodoo Child, Back in Black, even later like Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit, the vocal was king and the U67 was like its mighty saber. And still, to this day, most microphones available to purchase can trace their origins and can trace their tuning to likely the U67. This microphone wasn't good for rock music. This microphone was rock music. This is the sound. And it remained that way for seven years, which I guess isn't that long. <laughs> The U87 was designed to replace the U67, but not really to change the way it sounded. Even though a lot of people think the U87 and the U67 do sound different, that wasn't really the intention. The U67 used tubes to power it. You may have heard me mention tubes prior in the video, and they turned that tiny little microphone signal into something that was louder and capable of the preamps later down the line to make even louder. And these tubes were causing a lot of the issues that audio engineers were complaining about, namely audio distortion, the thing that today we love. The U87 featured a FET design, a field effect transistor, an entirely new technology meant to power the microphone without the external power supply. And they powered it using something called phantom power. Let's take a look at why Neumann wanted to do this. So in a tube microphone, whenever a signal gets too loud, this is what a distorted audio signal starts to look like. You can see on the waveform, the peaks start to become less uniform. This distorted audio wave sounds something like this. With a field effect transistor, a FET microphone, the amount of distortion was drastically lowered. This was seen as an improvement in accuracy at the time, even though in 2023, we don't see it as necessarily an improvement or a disadvantage, it's just different. And the U87 from then on out was and still is the most used microphone to date, at least when it comes to like high budget professional recordings from John Lennon's Imagine, Jeff Buckley's Grace, Kanye, Kendrick Lamar. It's honestly kind of stupid to name artists when it comes to the U87, because quite frankly, if you're a successful artist, you probably have used this microphone. And that's because the history of the Neumann U line is the history of recorded music. The Neumann U microphones aren't necessarily the perfect tone because it just happens to sound good. In the eyes of music history, the Neumann U series is the tone. It's the story of how the vocal found its place as the most prominent part of modern music. It's also the story about how music technology both adapts to reflect contemporary musical paradigms and also how it influences them. There's absolutely a reason why the U87 is the most desired and the most emulated microphone out today. Because it is the sound of music. It's a living symbol of how art and technology reflect each other over the years. And that is why it cost more 
than a cheap car. <laughs> Anyways, hope you learned something today. If you did, I would love if you hit that like button and subscribed and all the things that help the video out. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next one back in my own apartment. Bye-bye.